Thank you, and it's good to be here. I do convey some good news that there is a pathway to having a healthy and sustainable diet for the world's population by 2050. But, and I'll come to that at the end of my talk. This, the challenge is huge. Uh, how are we going to feed uh, what will be close to 10 billion people by 2050, a diet that is both healthy and sustainable? On the health side, the picture does not look good. This is looking at rates of obesity around the world, and they're rapidly increasing, steadily increasing in both men and women, and in both high-income and low-income countries. And as sure as day follows night, we know that epidemics of diabetes follow the epidemic of obesity. And then we see the problems of uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, kidney failure, premature death, and many other forms of suffering following that. The world is on this path. Next slide, please. Uh, it's uh, not, not working. Uh, on the environmental side, the picture is no prettier. I uh, think everyone here is well aware of the problems. You don't need fancy statistical models. What's changing is happening right before our eyes. Uh, the Arctic Ocean has opened up for the first time that humans have known. The snows on Kilimanjaro are almost gone. Glaciers are retreating rapidly all around the world, and the Greenland ice cap is uh, melting much more rapidly and accelerating uh, in terms of uh, melting uh, year by year. So I was privileged to co-chair the Eat Lancet Commission, which was charged with identifying a pathway to a healthy and sustainable diet for close to 10 billion people by 2050. As a first step, uh, as a first step, we identified and described what a healthy diet would be. Everybody agrees we should have a healthy diet, but to put numbers on that is challenging. We use the best available evidence from all sources. Uh, for example, the, this is a summary of controlled feeding studies uh, looking at different sources of protein and their effects on cardiovascular risk factors. And uh, for, on the left there, you can see that consumption of red meat compared to plant-based protein sources uh, substantially increases levels of blood, LDL, cholesterol, a very important risk factor for cardiovascular disease. We also looked at long-term epidemiologic studies uh, that have followed several hundred thousand here in this example, over 200,000 men and women for several decades and identified risks of type 2 diabetes. And there's a clear linear relationship between consumption of red meat and risk of type 2 diabetes. And we have similar kinds of data for total mortality, cardiovascular disease, and other health outcomes. I just should interject, you will probably see a story on Monday that red meat has no effect on health. That's important. Uh, do not believe that. Look at our website. Uh, I can't disclose further details. Yeah. Uh, next, please. Um, of course, if we don't eat red meat, uh, what uh, we pl we're, what we're used to replace red meat is critically important. And we've done studies looking at that comparison. And we have, this is looking at rates of coronary heart disease, number one cause of death in the world. And uh, to the left of that vertical line shows reductions in risk. And the biggest reduction is when we, re when we replace plant-based protein sources for red meat. But also even replace, replacing poultry and nuts for red meat gives some benefit. Next slide, please. Uh, in the Eat Lancet Commission, we took the, this, these kind of findings from many hundreds of different studies and boiled it all down, working on this for several years, and came up with uh, dietary targets for different components of, of the diet. Uh, this is what it would look like in a picture, uh, half uh, the plate being of fruits and vegetables. And then um, the animal source proteins are uh, are possible. We don't have to have everyone become a vegan. Uh, it's possible if you'd like to be a vegan, but uh, we can also consume small amounts of red meat, uh, dairy products, fish, and poultry if we want to have a, uh, an omnivore diet. But we have to keep those amounts rather small. For example, the target number for red meat was equivalent to about one hamburger per week or a big 12-ounce steak once per month, which is consistent with the traditional Mediterranean diet in many countries, in many cultures around the world. And there's a lot of flexibility of this, uh, with, with these dietary targets. These can be translated to the foods and flavors of cultures all around the world. 
And uh, in fact, this is very consistent with traditional diets in many places around the world. Next slide, please. We went on to calculate what would be the health impact of everybody adopted these dietary targets. And the health benefits would be huge, uh, both because we're reducing uh, the excessive amounts of less healthy food and increasing the amounts of healthy food. We calculated that using three different approaches that close to 11, billion, 11 million premature deaths could be prevented every year, which is about 20 to 25 percent of deaths that occur worldwide. So the impact is potentially huge on the health side. Uh, we looked then at the gaps between the dietary targets and what is actually being consumed in different regions of the world. That vertical red line uh, represents the dietary targets, and the different colors are different regions. And you can see, for example, red meat is at the top, and uh, the amounts consumed are very different among different parts of the world. And in, in North America, we consume many times the target number of red, for red meat, but sub-Saharan Africa actually consumes somewhat less than the target number. So we can't just say reduce red meat. It depends where you're starting from. But very consistently, virtually every part of the world consumes suboptimal amounts of vegetables, fruits, legumes, whole grains, and nuts. And mo most countries fish as well. Uh, the next step was to go on and see whether it was possible to produce uh, this the, a healthy diet defined this way and stay within planetary boundaries, sustainable planetary boundaries. And we use data on the environmental impacts of the different foods and food groups. On the left uh, are the numbers uh, in green for greenhouse gas production for beef. Uh, and on the right, uh, pl for plant-based protein sources. And you can say there are huge differences, 50, 100-fold, depending on which study you look at. Uh, poultry, fish, dairy products, pork, are in between, but still many times higher than the, number, than the amount of greenhouse gas produced by plant protein sources. Next slide, please. Uh, we then went through calculations, uh, and uh, Marco Springman at Oxford uh, led a lot of these uh, calculations, uh, looking at uh, the uh, greenhouse gas production per day uh, uh, presently, uh, and the, uh, uh, the limits which have been set by the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And uh, the food production boundary for greenhouse gas is at the top there, the green, bar, the green square, about five gigatons per year. Uh, we're just a little bit over that at present, but if we project out to, 200, to 2050, adding 2.5 billion more people and on, tra on track to consume more red meat, then the business as usual number projected would be close to 10 billion gigatons per year. Uh, uh, and, uh, excuse me, 10 gigatons per year, about double what we're consuming now. But if we switch to the planetary diet targets that I described, that would reduce that number by about half. So we could stay within planetary boundaries. Uh, if we then improve uh, food production efficiency, reduce waste, we can reduce the impact further. Next slide, please. Uh, of course, greenhouse gas is not the only concern. We looked at other planetary boundaries and uh, uh, land use included. And as you can see, uh, we really need to, at the bottom there, if we to stay within planetary boundaries for all of these conditions, we need to both have a healthy diet, adopt a healthy diet, improve our agricultural production methods, and also substantially reduce food waste. Next slide. Uh, that's a lot of numbers. Uh, this is what it looks like on, a ground, on the ground. This is actually from our family farm in Michigan. And it used to be small plots. Now it's just vast monoculture of corn and sometimes soybeans. And the sad thing is that only about 10% of this is eaten by humans. Most of it is fed to animals or goes into producing ethanol for driving cars. Uh, so th it's incredibly dysfunctional. We're both destroying our environment and undermining human health at the same time. Next slide, please. What does this mean for food production? Uh, the, uh, next slide, please. And uh, first of all, we don't need to increase cereal production if we don't feed all our, so much grain to animals. Uh, next slide, slide please. Uh, we do need to substantially increase vegetables, fruits, legumes, and nuts, and uh, fish uh, as well. Uh, and, of course, we need to, next slide, please, greatly reduce consumption of red meat. So to summarize, uh, feeding 10 billion people a year 
uh, is possible uh, if we assume a, a, adopt a, a healthy diet. We can stay within planetary boundaries, and it will improve the health and well-being of billions of people. This could allow us to pass on to our children a viable planet. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The but was, though, that this is not easy. It's going to require the continued input of everybody in this room and everyone around the world. Thank you.